history here. Today's video is going to be over Hamlin County, but it's going to be one in a series. I'd like to mention that I'm not going to cover the history of every single building and every single small community, or else I'd be here for quite a while. So if I miss something or simply fail to mention it, simply put it in the comments below. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. But first, are you sick of your beard feeling like sandpaper? Can you not find the right beard oil? We all go visit my good friend Jason over at the Beard Guy and Friends for all your beardly needs. As some of y'all might already know, the area in general had long been the home of native people, mainly the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Creeks, and Shawnee. They enjoyed sailing near rivers, and Hamlin County just so happens to be located right in between the Holston and Nolichucky rivers. At the time of the first settlers in our small little county, native people hadn't been pushed out yet. So our immigrant and pioneer ancestors frequently had to deal with raids upon their homesteads. Also, most of this area, including all of East Tennessee, uh, sits right in the middle of the Great War Path, which extends from as far south as Mobile, Alabama, to as far north as New York. So about Hamlin County. Well, it didn't exist until the spring of 1870. So at the time of the first settlers in the late 1770s, most of this area was still known as the Southwest Territory, even though it was still technically part of North Carolina. In the mid-1780s, it would become Caswell County when the state of Franklin was formed, but only briefly. After Tennessee was formed, the area that would become Hamlin County was part of Jefferson, Granger, and Hawkins County, with most of Russellville, Cheeks Crossroads, Barton Springs, and Wattsburg areas being part of Hawkins County. Hamlin County is also at the center of the Great Stage Road and the Kentucky Road. Remember these for later. So to answer a question I was asked, the first visitors to Hamlin County, now that possibility, it could be any one of a few people. We'll just say that it could have been Needham and Arthur in the 1670s, the first Englishman to travel into the Cherokee Nation and return, or it could even have been Sir Alexander Cumming in 1730, when he traveled to the Overhill Cherokee towns. While today you wouldn't really know it, the tiny Three Springs area was once a pretty highly significant little village, and let me tell you why. The area that would soon become Three Springs, Tennessee, was first visited in 1761 when Lieutenant Henry Timberlake spent the night in the Delap Cave on his 23-day journey down the River Holston. While encamped on the banks of the Holston, uh, Timberlake would lose either his watch or his rifle. I've heard both sides of that story, and either way, ended up spending a sleepless night in the cave. Now, the cave itself had a pretty rich history, as it had been used by the local native people for many, many moons prior. It was also used in the Civil War to mine nitrile from bat poop, and again by our residents of the Three Springs Hotel. The first family to settle in this area would be Pharaoh Cobb and his family. They came to the area on a flatboat to claim a land grant given to them by the state of North Carolina following the American Revolution. Now, Pharaoh would build a massive brick house and it would become the ancestral home of all of the Cobb family in this area. Cobb himself was a veteran of several small expeditions against the Cherokee and was with Colonel Isaac Shelby at the Battle of Musgrove Hill in North Carolina. At that time, this home would have been considered a plantation. It is known that it had a racetrack and then even a room called the Andrew Jackson Room, as the president was pretty close friends with the Cobb family. He frequently came to see him on his way from Washington to Nashville. The home would remain in possession of the Cobb family until Cherokee Lake was completed in 1940. The next building would be the Three Springs Hotel. It was built sometime in the late 1800s. I do not know the exact date. I cannot find it. Uh, it was built nearby to a couple of springs and offered three different types of spring water that at that time was thought to cure many ailments. Now this hotel was demolished when Cherokee Lake was created, but its foundations can still be seen during the late fall and early spring months. Now this hotel was within miles of the Mooresburg Springs, Galbraith Springs hotels, and the world famous Tate Springs being a little further down the road. Tate Springs would also have its own mill and schoolhouse. And then a, there was a bridge that crossed the river that, uh, led to Mooresburg. None of these things stand today. In 1783, at the intersection of the Stagecoach and Kentucky Roads, Jesse Cheek built a large home and general store, a stock pens, a blacksmith shop, and a post office which was be built by the year 1800. 
In 1802, in conjunction with the Dedrick and Conway families, an even larger brick store was built, and it stood about 50 yards from the original Cheeks store. Now, Cheeks Crossroads was a thriving little community for quite some time until Russellville started to take off and expand. The store's account book listed the Crockett, Taylor, and Outlaw families, as well as teacher Benjamin Kitchen as regular customers here. It would be torn down decades ago to make way for Rod's truck shop and later Joe's garage. And the old Dedrick store was demolished to make way for Molly. Judge Dedrick closed the store in 1844 to go and study law. He later became the Chief Justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court. Now today, this highly important area is marked only by a small iron sign. Now another significant home was named Greenwood. It was the ancestral home of all of the Taylor family and was built in 1832 by Judge Dedrick himself. Uh, the home would be bought by Franklin Taylor in 1844 and would be named for the few hundred boxwood trees around the property. During the Civil War, CSA General Joseph Kershaw would use the home as his headquarters. This home would be demolished in 1959 and sat between National Cash Register and Lear Sigler Factory. A small shed from this property now sits on the property of the Long Street Museum. Russellville was once larger than Morristown. It had its own train station, post office, bank, and several listed businesses according to the Tennessee State Gazetteer and Business Directory for 1860 to 1861. Located along the Great Stage Road and very near the Kentucky Road, the town was pretty significant in the early days of Tennessee. One of the first homes built here was the Kaufman Home. It was built in 1783 by Andrew Kaufman, who was a Revolutionary War soldier claiming a 400-acre land grant. The home still stands today, but in its early days it was a stagecoach inn that offered rest and food for weary travelers along the stage road. Three presidents and three Civil War generals stayed here. During the Civil War, it would also be used as an improvised field hospital. It is also known that Warring Cherokee frequently raided this home before they were forced out. Equally as interesting as the home is the barn behind it, where Tidens Lane and even Andrew Kaufman himself preached many a sermon. It is thought that the State of Franklin Committee held meetings here as well. One of the rooms in the barn was also used as a makeshift church for the community before Bent Creek Baptist Church was built, and it is in perfect condition. Another significant home is the Red Door Tavern. Now, I could have made a whole video just on this home, but it was built in 1785 by Colonel James Roddy, who was a signer of the Tennessee Constitution. He was granted a large tract of land by Continental Congress in recognition of his services in Kings Mountain. In addition to raising a family at this home, Colonel Roddy also offered rest for weary travelers. It has also seen the likes of Louis de Philippe, future King of France, and a Andrew Jackson. During the Civil War, it sheltered a large portion of General James Longstreet's troops. It has also witnessed the execution and burial on its hallowed grounds of two unnamed deserters who await another stern judgment while sleeping on the hillside above the house. During the Civil War, General James Longstreet would use the William Ninney home as his winter HQ. His troops would be scattered all over the hillside between Hay Slope, Bethesda Cemetery, and even as far up as Russellville Cemetery. A fun fact about General Longstreet was that he was close friends with, you might not have heard of him, Ulysses S. Grant during their time at West Point. Another fun fact, Longstreet was also Grant's best man at his wedding in 1848. Now Longstreet and his movements could have given me enough to do an entire speech over. Now for a time, the Ninny home, which was built in the mid-1830s, with an addition being built in the 1850s, it fell on hard times and it was in rough shape. Fortunately, the Lakeway Area Civil War Preservation Association undertook the tedious task of restoring this home, and it looks great. I suggest anyone who hasn't visited here to go pay Mr. Kelly Ford a visit. An interesting fact about William Ninney was that he was a very strong advocate for bringing the railroad through Hamlin County. Fortunately, he did not get to see the fruits of his labor and died in 1857, and the railroad would come through in 1858. The historic cane mill that sat in Russellville was built in 1836 on the site of an even older mill. Cane Mill was located on the fast-moving Fall Creek, which proved to be a blessing, as the mill, which was very likely one of the largest grist mills around, could be fitted with larger grinding wheels, which provided top quality flour and meal. The mill would run day and night in the winter of 1863, 
when General James Longstreet camped out at his winter retreat. Unfortunately, this diamond was lost to a fire in 1971. Bethesda Church was organized in 1832 by members of Hopewell Presbyterian Church. The church is one of the oldest in this section of the state. Now, the church itself wouldn't be built until 1835, but it was built on land donated by Joseph Shannon. Church records show that services were not held regularly here until 1842. During the Civil War, the church would be split between Unionist and Secessionist ideologies. This would lead the church to suspend all activities for the duration of the war. During the winter of 1863, Confederate troops commanded by none other than General James Longstreet arrived to spend the winter. They remained here until February 1864 and used this building as an improvised field hospital. A few military engagements would also occur near the church in both October and November 1864. At some point during the war, it is not known which side fired, but a cannonball penetrated one of the it caused major structural damage that was repaired by reinforcing the walls with large iron rods. After the war, people could not forget the atrocities that occurred inside the church and decided not to resume services. Whitesburg was once the largest town between Knoxville and Abington. It would be named for Isaac White, who was a postmaster here. It would first be settled around the mid-1780s when the Reverend Tidens Lane founded Mint Creek Baptist Church and build his home. Now, in the late 1850s, the railroad gave rise to a business district, which at one time included saloons, stores, and a hotel, and several other businesses. After the Civil War, Weisberg would become an important shipping hub for many slabs of marble coming from the north hills of the North Holston River to the, that went to the railroad for distribution all over the eastern seaboard. Now, for many years after, a formerly enslaved man named Frederick Netherland played an important role in the region's thriving marble industry who hauled huge slabs of marble from the Holston River to the railroad depot at Whitesburg with his 32 mule team. Whitesburg is also the final resting place for Reverend Titus Lane who rests just up on a hill on the Whitesburg Pike. Now I know I'm missing quite a few pieces of Hamlin County history here but please feel free to uh, get on my Facebook page or comment down below let me know what I missed. Thanks for watching.